Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar today. We're um, pleased to to be able to uh, discuss uh, energy and, and climate uh, for um, our one of our most critical infrastructure sectors, uh, uh, water and wastewater. And, and today, we're really pleased to be joined by our friends from Botrop, Germany. Uh, so I'll, let me uh, turn it over to Bob, who I think will introduce um, uh, Mayor Tischler, and uh, then we'll get started. Thanks, Jeff, and good afternoon and guten Abend to our friends in Germany. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this special webinar. I'm Bob Lazaro, Executive Director of the Northern Virginia Regional Commission, and I wanted to thank our co-hosts at COG and DC Water for all their assistance in making this event possible. It is my honor this afternoon not only to welcome you, but to introduce you to a special guest before the webinar begins, the Lord Mayor of the City of Botrop, the Honorable Bern Tischler. Elected in August of 2009 as the Lord Mayor, Bern has significantly and positively influenced the city. Perhaps the top of Bern's accomplishment is his leadership of Botrop's Innovation City Program a true model of comprehensive climate and energy planning for local governments. Byrne has always been exceptionally generous with his time and knowledge when sharing with us Botrop's efforts to reduce CO2 emissions. For those who have not been to Botrop, I urge you to run, not walk, to see what the city has accomplished with large-scale energy efficiency retrofits, residential and commercial solar, green infrastructure, and social inclusion, just to name a few. We are pleased to have been the beneficiaries of his and his city's generous sharing of knowledge and experience. With that said, I'm pleased to welcome the Lord Mayor and my friend, Bern Tischler. Bern? Oh, thank you so much, uh, dear Bob, uh, dear Mr. King, Mr. Peart Dale, and um, lieber Herr Dr. Günther. And ladies and gentlemen, of course, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to say a few words for this webinar on sustainable and resilient energy management of wastewater treatment plants. I think we can all agree that water is one of the most valuable natural resource on our planet, of course. How we use it and how to use it in a sustainable way is therefore one of the big important issues we have to address, especially against the backdrop of climate change and other environmental issues. The reclamation of water, for example, through wastewater processing is a key factor of sustainability in relation to water. Wastewater treatment plants are established parts of the water industry in developed countries. However, we need to be aware of the fact that wastewater processing itself is a very energy intense, intensive uh, process. Bottrop, as the German innovation city, has set the goal to make its wastewater treatment plant emission neutral. As Innovation City, we already have experience in building new and modernizing existing structures in terms of energy efficiency and energy saving. Still, transferring our experience to a large scale building like a wastewater treatment plant is, of course, a big challenge. I'm certain, though, that we will be able to reach the goals we set ourselves. I also hope that the insights we will be gaining in the coming years and through the process of bringing our wastewater treatment plant to emission neutrality will be adaptable for other cities and regions around the world. We have, as Bob said, great success in sharing our experiences as Innovation City with other cities, regions, and countries all around the world, and giving them a kind of blueprint to adapt to their own individual circumstances. I hope the transformation process 
of our wastewater treatment plant will be able um, to uh, create a similar success. Ladies and gentlemen, climate change and its uh, env environmental consequences are real and they pose um, existential problems for mankind. The more ideas we develop to deal with these problems and the quicker we make them reality, the better our chances to manage climate change. Let us act now and let us act together. And uh, Dr. Günther is uh, really a specialist in uh, these themes and I'm very glad and uh, I would like to thank him as well uh, that um, he is in the webinar and um, I wish you um, a good discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, as Bob and Dale know, I always close with the old minor salutation from good old Germany. It's called Glück auf. And um, I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, let's um, move on here to um, the the core part of the webinar and turn it over to um, Dr. Gunther. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dale, Jeff, and Chris for uh, inviting me to this uh, webinar. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tischler, uh, for the greetings um, from Bottrop to the wastewater treatment plant of Bottrop. But actually, I'm sitting in Essen, um, uh, where I live. So, um, yes, I try um, now to share my screen in order to start the presentation. OK. Can everybody see um, the presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Okay, then I will start. Um, so um, you call it a case study from Bottrop um, years ago. We created the slogan, uh, converting our wastewater treatment plant to a power plant. And um, this is uh, the topic of the next round about 20 minutes. And uh, I will tell you the development of the wastewater treatment plant uh, of Bottrop from a, I said, simple wastewater treatment plant um, to a um, uh, uh, plant which uh, has its focus on the um, electricity in order um, to um, produce all the electricity we really need um, at the plant. So uh, let me start with a, a slide of um, uh, a, a little bit uh, geographic. Uh, so um, you see, uh, first of all, red signed um, uh, in blue Europe, of course, and um, in a red color um, Germany. In the next step, you see in blue the, Germ the German um, borders, and um, there in red color the um, uh, land North Rhine-Westphalia, the region, and uh, this region is um, uh, for us uh, of Amtsche Genossenschaft and Lippeverband divided in two regions. Um, the one region has the river Amtsche um, um, and the other region has the river Lippe, uh, where we um, send our water to. Um, let's have a closer look to the uh, region of Amtsche Genossenschaft and Lippeverband. So, we um, have around about 54 um, wastewater treatment plants um, in the uh, Lippe region, and we have around about we have only four wastewater treatment plants in the blue-colored uh, Emscher region. And one of them, this is signed with a red um, circle here, um, is in the wastewater treatment plant of Bottrop. So you see the data um, under here. Um, the two regions are totally different. We have a very a large region um, in the Lippeverband with a lot of um, um, uh, with 54 um, 
uh, wastewater treatment plants and only 1.4 um, million um, inhabitants. And on the other hand, we have the uh, Emscher Genossenschaft, uh, in comparison, a very small region with a high um, population density. So um, on this uh, picture, you see our wastewater treatment plant of Bottrop. And of course, um, you see our uh, solar uh, sludge drying uh, here in front, um, which we start building um, one and a half year ago. And um, actually, we are uh, going over into operation with a solar uh, sludge drying. Later on, I will tell you a little bit more about this project, because, of course, this is one of our uh, most uh, important and, uh, of course, spectacular um, projects we have, actually. The wastewater treatment plant is uh, one of the largest wastewater treatment plants in Germany. The construction was between 1991 and 1996. The construction costs were around about 200, uh, 230 million euros. So the catchment area is 240 square kilometers, and we are cleaning the wastewater of around about 1.4 million uh, personal equivalents. In comparison to the um, to the wastewater treatment, uh, we um, treat the sludge of more than 4 million personal equivalents. And this is very special and the um, reason why we call it the central sludge um, treatment, Bottrop, because we also treat the um, sludges from our wastewater treatment plants in Dienstlaken, it's called Emscher Mouth, and uh, also from Duisburg. Um, concerning the wastewater stream, we have an influence of 8.5 uh, cubic meters a second. The energy consumptions, and we always uh, turn to our topic energy now uh, during my um, uh, during the slides I, I show you. Um, the energy consumption of this area um, is uh, comparable to around about um, 30,000 inhabitants, to a city with around about 30,000 inhabitants. So one uh, look back uh, in the year 1929, um, I like this picture a lot because um, it shows, um, yes, uh, how we uh, develop the, um, the, the plant. These are simple settlement tanks. Um, in these years, uh, only the wastewater was uh, treated uh, in sedimentation um, tanks and um, the um, sludges um, which are um, uh, produced there in the settlement tanks, they were put into the regions you see uh, to the left and to the right of uh, these uh, tanks and the treated water was uh, uh, brought to the canal and uh, back to uh, flow, that flows back to the river Emscher. Well, nowadays, um, our wastewater treatment plant looks like this. Um, you see there are uh, three lines. Um, this, my picture is at the point. Um, there are uh, three lines, and we have a biological, uh, a mechanical and biological wastewater treatment, and even the biological wastewater treatment is built as an upstream denitrification in three separate lines. Uh, just uh, having a closer look at all the buildings over there, you see this is the screen buildings where we separate the screens from the wastewater. There are three screens uh, side by side and also three screens back to back. The gap size um, becomes smaller, starting with 50 millimeters, then in the second step, 15 millimeters, and at least only 10 millimeters. After the screen building, we have our grid chamber. So there we uh, collect fats and oils, of course, and um, also the sand from the wastewater stream. In the third um, step of mechanical wastewater treatment, we have the primary sedimentation, where uh, bigger organic materials um, settled in the uh, tanks, and uh, they were uh, brought to um, static um, thickening and afterwards to uh, the digesters. 
Then you see, of course, uh, the area of activated sludge tanks. Tanks. These are around about 250 cubic meters, and the special thing is that the tanks are around about 10 meters deep. And um, so you know, uh, you understand why we need a lot of energy in order to bring the um, the aeration to the sludge uh, to the activated sludge tanks. In the last step, um, we have the Finally, uh, sedimentation tanks, and um, there the sludge is um, divided from the cleaned water. The cleaned water is pumped to the uh, Emscher River, and um, the sludges uh, were thickened in a flotation and uh, then uh, brought to the digester. And these are the digesters here. Uh, um, during the night, they are lined in blue and uh, are very uh, spectacular here in the region of uh, of Botor. I think everyone knows uh, the blue signed uh, digesters. The um, sludge is one of the most uh, important topics in in Botrop, as I already told you. Um, you see here our sludge dewatering uh, in the chamber filter presses and. Um, these uh, uh, on the right side, the key figures for our sludge treatment. So we have around about 1.5 million cubic meters digested sludge a year, uh, as I told you, from around about 4 million um, personal equivalents. Uh, it has a dry solid matter of around about 4%, the digested sludge. And uh, years before, we um, had a conditioning of the sludge with coal. Um, further ago, as you remember the, the picture of 1929, you uh, can imagine that um, there are a lot of coal all um, inside uh, the, the sludges. And um, also in the beginning of the 17th, 80s, and, and 19th years, uh, we always had a lot of coal um, in the in the sludge of our wastewater treatment plant because um, coal mines are even typical for our region. And um, yes, after um, the coal uh, was no longer in the sludge because um, uh, nowadays uh, we don't have any uh, mines left. So um, that uh, we had to um, buy coals from uh, from the market, and, uh, at least they were brought to Botrop um, from regions in South America, and um, of course um, this is not uh, very uh, um, good for our climate, and um, this is the main reason why we um, started uh, to think about using the sun energy in order to dry our sludges. And um, we have also the incineration at the um, treatment plant. And this is a, a good uh, way in order to uh, get heat from the incineration to uh, dry our sludges. And this was the beginning of the project. So you see, I already um, um, uh, signed um, that uh, we don't use coal anymore, but uh, we are conditioning now our our sludges with polymers, and um, but this has the effect that we are not dewatering uh, longer, approximate uh, to 40 percent uh, dry solids, but nowadays only to 28 percent solids. But afterwards, we put the sludge to the solar drying, and um, the solar drying has a capacity of around about 220 tons a year we can uh, um, uh, dry there. So um, let's have a first uh, look at the, um, at the uh, incineration. You see it here and we um, also built um, a new waste air um, uh, purification in order to to treat the the air uh, from the from the incineration and um, yes in the next slide you see an overview of the uh, whole plant again um, uh, signed um, 
you see the the way of wastewater treatment um, and at least uh, the um, way of uh, sludge treatment because uh, in, this, in our digester we produce the biomass and gas and the biomass is dewatered and in our solar sludge drying dried uh, so that it can be um, treated in the incineration without using any coal anymore but um, uh, the also, we have the gas from the digesters, and the gas is used in the block heat and power plant. And um, yes, uh, the main um, uh, parts for uh, producing energy you see here signed in red. This is, of course, um, uh, the, our biomass and gas. Um, this is the block heat and power plant. And uh, in the incineration, we have a steam turbine in order to produce energy. Uh, we also have photovoltaic systems uh, on our roofs and um, we use uh, the uh, solar for sludge drying. And uh, on the right side, you see that we have a wind power plant uh, now already around about five years, I think. And um, there we produce also energy we need it at the wastewater treatment plant and also uh, in order to, uh, to keep it uh, balanced. Uh, that means we have, um, we produce the energy we need it uh, directly uh, at the plant. So um, in order to uh, show you uh, what we did all the last years, um, I have here summed up all the, the uh, projects. So we had a repowering of heat and power, of the heat and power plant we had a refurbishment of the incineration, the replacement of a steam uh, turbine, the construction of photovoltaic system, also of the wind power plant. Um, we are planning a, a screw turbine for hydropower, but uh, this is still only uh, a plan in because we uh, had some problems to, to, um, to put it directly to our process. And, um, but, you see here planning and building of sludge drying with internal waste heat recovered and supported by solar. This is our uh, new project, which we finished actually. All in all, this is bundled in a superior energy management system. Now uh, you see some pictures, uh, of course, here, uh, this is the repowering of the block heat and power plants. <clears throat> And now we have uh, four um, uh, motors with a um, capacity of 1.2 megawatt. The invest investment costs of 4.2 million euros. Um, uh, they were uh, around about um, paid back in, in a period of four years. And uh, this power plant started operation in 2016. Now you see a picture of uh, the steam turbine we changed. Of course, um, on the left side of the picture, you see that it is that it was necessary to to change um, this system. Uh, we did this in uh, 2017. The electric power raises off uh, to around about uh, 4.1 megawatt. These are around about 28 percent more than we had uh, at uh, years before. Uh, the whole investment costs were around about 13.8 million euros. So you see here the fitting of the condenser for the um, uh, steam turbine. Uh, they uh, were um, charged um, by the EEG law from, from Germany with uh, 7 cent per kilowatt hour. And uh, this means at least um, the uh, costs for the speed up of the turbine, uh, which costs around about 2.6 million euros were paid back in around about one and a half year. These are pictures of the photovoltaic system. They are not so uh, huge, but um, it, it was important for us to show um, that we try to use every kind of electricity which uh, nature uh, gave us. So um, these are only uh, in uh, the peak 40 
1.5 kilowatts um, kilowatt the investment costs of uh, 71,000 euros. The construction time was in 2016 and they started operation in 2016 with an electricity production of around about 33,000 kilowatt hours in, uh, a year. It's not so much, but it is um, uh, important to, uh, to make sure that also um, the energy from, from solar can be used and should be used. Uh, the next uh, slide, you see our wind power plant. We built it, uh, I think, uh, five years ago. Uh, it has a power of three megawatts. Um, the up height is uh, 100 meters and the diameter, the rotor diameter, 120 meters. The investment costs were 5 million euros and um, the annual return of electricity is 5,000 megawatts a year. So this is uh, also an important part of uh, our energy concept. Yes, and uh, here you see uh, our new building and uh, I'm quite a little bit proud that we did this in such a short time and um, because um, it's around about one and a half year um, since we started uh, to build this. And uh, you see uh, a solar plant and uh, it has a dimension of around about 41,000 square meters. And we use, uh, of course, the internal waste heat from the incineration and solar power in order to dry our sludges. The saving and uh, I uh, think um, in the in the start up of our um, of our webinar, uh, they both told us already about saving um, a CO2. Um, so we reduce the uh, reduce the CO2 emission because um, we stopped uh, using the coal uh, at around about uh, sixty thousand tons per year, and. Um, Yes, uh, the coal we needed were around about twenty thousand tons, and we don't need the we do not we don't need this anymore. So it's, it's right. Yes, you see the new team. There are eight employers now. Um, we have two loaders and at least uh, forty-one electric moles, um, who uh, um, uh, grab the 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 sludges. Um, you see the the vents uh, uh, at the top of the the building, and uh, they uh, transported the um, the um, air loaded by by water out of the um, the glass uh, building, and uh, to an um, to a, uh, an air cleaning uh, and at least a biofilter system. Yes, this is um, another picture of uh, one of the, the glass buildings. Um, we have at least uh, 32 uh, buildings like this. And uh, uh, we have 41 uh, of these um, electric molds uh, in order to, to change one when we have uh, problems with it. So um, once again, uh, let's have a look at the uh, whole system of Bottrop uh, once yesterday. And I uh, only want to, to, um, to pronounce uh, the conditioning with coal of the sludges we had um, uh, in, the, in the past. And uh, also the externally purchased uh, electricity we needed uh, during this uh, period. And uh, now, and nowadays, uh, we don't uh, use coal anymore. We don't need uh, the electricity from the externally purchased electricity. And um, yes, you see, we have the wind power, the photovoltaic, and uh, the solar drying of the sludge. This uh, again is uh, when all the uh, the um, projects finished. You see, in 2016, the heat and power plant, the steam turbine at the end of 2017, the wind power plant uh, at 2016, photovoltaic at 2016, and uh, so all in all, 
we um, have um, now round about uh, the self-sufficiency of our um, annual energy balance already. So one uh, picture of my uh, colleague, um, Alex, uh, and he showed that uh, it was in 2018 when we break the 10 uh, megawatt barrier. Uh, um, he's standing in front of our, um, our uh, dashboard uh, we have in the entrance of our building. And uh, you see that uh, the most of the energy is, uh, oh, this is in German, sorry, therefore, um, uh, our, most of the energy is produced by the turbine as well as the block heat and power plant. And of course, uh, the, um, the windcraft is, uh, uh, has a uh, part of 7% uh, and the photovoltaic of 1% um, concerning the whole um, producing of energy. Yes, that's it so far. I said thank you very much for your attention. And uh, yes, later on, I think we can discuss uh, the way of a bot drop in order to um, become self sufficient in energy. Thank you, Dr. Gunther. That was a really uh, interesting presentation. And congratulations on your new solar uh, drying operation. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of curious, uh, having a background in horticulture, have you ever thought of uh, integrating any uh, horticulture aspects to your, your greenhouse operation there with the solar? <laughs> and it was really cool to see the, the robotics as well. That was pretty neat, the electric mole. Yeah, the electric mole. Uh, I, was, I was wondering that it is uh, called electric mole in English because uh, in Germany we say elektrisches Schwein. Uh, because it, it looks like an, an, a pig, so that would be translated. But um, the, um, the producer of, um, of the system said that there are molds. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So um, I think uh, we'll hold questions and move uh, to uh, Chris Piot from DC Water. Chris, are you ready to take the, take the helm here? Uh, I am. I'm going to share my screen here. Thanks for the opportunity. I'll just uh, stall for a second as this gets brought up. Fascinating to hear what's happening over in Germany. Europe is always slightly, if not more than slightly ahead of us. So uh, <laughs> tough act to follow. Um, but we are implementing some interesting things that I want to tell you about. Um, and where I think we're moving in the right direction. All right. Can everybody see a single slide now? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, thank you. So, um, I, yeah, I wanted to also talk about sort of uh, wastewater resource recovery. I am, I'm Chris Piat. I'm the, I'm an engineer at, at uh, DC Water and I work at Blue Plains. This is, this is my home here. It's a, an extremely large advanced wastewater treatment plant, 157 acres. I just did the math, that's 65 he hectares of hectares of space that we take up. And we are, we're out of space. You know, we got the river on one side, we have I-295 on this side, and we have Naval Research Lab on this side. So we are out of space. Um, and, you know, it's my job to sort of turn over rocks and try and find opportunities to make use of resources that we don't traditionally um, uh, take advantage of. Um, I was brought in to manage the biosolids program, um, the treated human manure that comes out of the plant. Um, but I also now am working on a lot of green electricity issues, uh, thermal heat recovery, uh, and uh, the sale of renewable energy credits, all of which comes from the biosolids. You know, it's our job in this industry to take the pollutants, I'm gonna use air quotes here, the pollutants out of the water. And our permit is largely the pollutants are uh, carbon and nutrients because we don't want those carbon and nutrients going out into the river and then out into the Chesapeake Bay and upsetting the balance of that delicate and extremely valuable resource out there, the Chesapeake Bay. So we take the carbon and nutrients out and we make sure that they don't end up in the river. And this is this is our effluent here, this dark spot. It looks inky black, but it's clear. It's the clearest spot on the Potomac River. And whenever there's a 
fishing tournaments in, in DC. They, there's always all kinds of fishing boats gathered around this because it's a great spot to catch bass uh, because it's clear. Uh, they can see the bait and the water's a little bit warm. Um, but carbon and nutrients, carbon is energy and nutrients is our fertilizer. So what we, we wanted to do is to try and um, put equipment in place that would allow us to take advantage of those two assets. There, there really should not be considered a liability. They should be considered an asset. We've got to maximize those assets. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our digesters that we put in. We, we spent a long time vetting technologies and ultimately decided on uh, mesophilic digestion in the middle here preceded by uh, thermal hydrolysis, which really is this process that allows us to A, sell the biosolids product because it, we pasteurize it, and B, um, make a very, very high quality product and a lot of gas that we can then make use of. Uh, so, um, you know, our, we don't even consider ourselves a wastewater treatment plant, but rather a resource recovery facility, recovering, of course, water, the world's most precious commodity, but also the nutrients and carbon and energy that I spoke of. And carbon is energy, but I like to split it apart because I personally don't think it's terribly sustainable to turn all that carbon that we collect into energy. You know, if a bear goes, is in the woods, there's a grizzly bear in Alaska and it goes over to the river and it gets hungry and it takes a salmon out. It uh, eats the salmon out of the river and it uses some of that energy for its body. And then it, you know, goes and poops in the woods and leaves some of that energy for the forest floor. And it's, so I think it's really important to return some of that carbon from to the land from which it came. So we have these digesters that allow us to do that. We make as much green energy as we can. And then we have this highly stable biosolids product coming out of the bottom that we can recycle back to the land. So it's really nice. And, and we, we've done this for forever. Even before we had digesters, we would take lime stabilized biosolids out to farmland but we only really had one place to take it, either farmland or we did some mine reclamation work. But it was a little bit stinky. We certainly couldn't sell it to the public. So when we chose this equipment, the digester equipment, we wanted to make sure that we made a product that would allow us to tighten that circle. A, to take truck miles off the, off the road, but also to um, allow us to recycle some of those carbon, some of that carbon, some of those nitri uh, nutrients back in an urban setting so that we could you know, improve the soils uh, in DC and the surrounding area and use it on uh, athletic ball fields and community gardens and, and all of that. Um, and it's it's been tremendously successful. So I wanna tell you some about that and then um, talk about some of our, our future plans. So the digester and the combined heat and power project, which is our turbines um, converts a waste into an asset. You know, it's it was very, in the not too distant future, our industry has sort of the paradigm has been that this is a waste and a liability that we need to get rid of the biosolids. And this turns it into an asset and it's, uh, we are generating clean, green, renewable energy in the form of electricity and recovered heat for steam. Um, that fertilizer product returns carbon and nutrients back to the earth. As I mentioned, it reduces our carbon footprint dramatically. We're the biggest user of electricity in DC. And this project has uh, reduced our carbon footprint, um, saves us on operating expenses and generates some revenue that we can make use of. So it's an incredibly energy efficient system. I'm not gonna go through the whole process, but you saw that, um, that photo, that aerial photo at, at the beginning that showed all of our liquid processes. There are three spots that we collect the solids and we collect them all, blend them together and we put them through the, the thermal hydrolysis process here. It's a high heat, high pressure system. It's a Norwegian technology manufactured by Canby. Um, and it's high heat, 160 degrees centigrade, not Fahrenheit, but centigrade. And it's a batch system. So it, it, uh, it holds it for 20 minutes, 22 minutes. And that's well above the EPA time and temperature uh, curves necessary to reach class A status for the biosolids, which then allows us to sell it to the public. Um, well above it. Uh, and it's also high in air quotes, high pressure. It's high by our standards, but not terribly high. It's about six bars of pressure, 90 PSI, six times atmospheric pressure. And then when it gets to this last tank um, after the batch, it goes into this last tank and that is a, that's, that's called the flash tank and it's back at atmospheric pressure. So that sudden pressure difference causes the cells to burst. So then we have an incredibly available food source that's sterilized 
to feed into the digesters, which are filled with a dense population of archaea. You know, you have archaea in your gut. Uh, it's archaea's job in nature to convert organic matter to methane. Everybody knows what digesters do, so that's what we do. But because we have this highly available food source, we get more gas production and we get a very stable product coming out of the bottom. That's our biosalts product. So we collect the gas off the top, clean it in a building back here, clean it up to standards that allow us to burn it in these turbines. We have three five megawatt turbines in this building right here. Uh, and it, you know, the gas serves as the fuel, the turbines spin. We capture that motion and we convert that motion to electricity. We make about eight megawatts of power there, all of which we use on site. We our, our demand is 25 megawatts. So it's it serves to provide about a third of our needs, which is great, reduces our costs, reduces our carbon footprint. Um, but maybe the, the coolest part about this is that we chose turbines specifically because they run hot. We could have put internal combustion engines in and got a little bit more electricity, but they don't run as hot. And we wanted something that ran hot so that we could pull the heat off. We put heat recovery steam generators at the end of each of the turbines, pull the heat off, convert it into steam. And then that is what we use to heat up the thermal hydrolysis process. Um, so we don't need any external energy to heat this up. It's completely self-sufficient. If we weren't doing that, if we had an IC engine here and we weren't making enough heat to pull off, we would have to have a giant boiler here burning natural gas to make steam to heat this up. So when we did the energy balance, it made much more sense to put in the less efficient from an electricity standpoint turbines because we would get more heat out of it. Uh, and that's the electricity part of it. I, I really, I mean, I want to talk a little bit about the biosolids very, very briefly. I know this is this is green energy and, and energy sustainability, but because the product comes in here highly available, it comes out, the, the solids that come out of the bottom are, are very stable. It's an incredibly good biosolids product um, that we can then sell to the public. And we've got a whole bunch of different products that we that we sell to the public. Uh, and the benefits of this is it reduces the bio, the digesters, reduce the biosolids volume. So we don't, we don't have as much to haul. It improves the product quality. It generates that clean green renewable power, cuts our greenhouse gas emis emissions dramatically. This one project, cut our emissions uh, by our, our greenhouse gas emissions for the entire organization by one third. It cut it by about a, about 50,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent emissions annually, which is pretty, pretty impressive. And oh, by the way, it saves us millions of dollars a year annually. So it is, I think this perfect combination, rare combination maybe even of municipal projects that make great environmental and economic sense. Um, this is our Bloom product, our biosolids product. We've branded it as Bloom, uh, and we sell it all over the DC region. Um, we have uh, sold, last year we sold about 45,000 tons, English tons, I didn't convert it to metric, sorry, of, um, of Bloom products throughout the DC area to farmers, landscapers, soil blenders, uh, people who do athletic fields, all kinds of people. So it's it's uh, it's moving. It's it's a valued commodity in in the uh, in the region. And we have a website here if you're interested in more details. Bloomsoil.com. Tons of information on that. So the savings and revenue over the first five years of of operation. We started operations in 2016, and you know the sale of of the bloom generated some revenue. Nothing you know, to sneeze at last year, we made about $200,000 in revenue, but really the big, big part of the economics is the savings. If we weren't doing this, we would have to pay somebody $45 a ton to take it away. That's the paradigm in our industry. And as a result, we saved two and a half million dollars. Um, and if you look at the rest of the things, just, just on sheer volume, if we hadn't built the digesters, we would be have an extra 700 tons a day that we would have to manage and we would have to be adding lime to that. Um, and there is some power savings. It's a little bit complicated because we pay somebody to run the, the, the CHP process, but we also have renewable energy credit sales that we, we made. We sold over a million dollars worth of renewable energy credits. And if you add all that up, the savings and the revenue over the first five years, it's, it's $81 million um, uh, ahead that we are, had we not built the digester. So that, you know, the digesters cost quite a bit to build, but you know, with that type of a return, 
And it's going to grow because we're going to sell more renewable energy credits at a higher value and more bloom at a higher value. But if we just use this first five years, it ends up being about a 16 year, 15 or 16 year payback period, which is great because the bulk of the investment was for the digesters, which have about a 75 year lifespan. So it's a, a very, very good investment for us. So, you know, buoyed by the success that we had with the, with the digester projects and the CHP, we decided that we wanted to look at other opportunities throughout the city because we're not just the Blue Plains Advanced Wastewater Treatment Plant. We are DC Water. We provide clean water to the citizens of DC and we also pump sewage all over the city. So we have all these assets all over the city and we, we thought let's put together a dream map and see what we could do if we were to take advantage of all these different opportunities, including solar, uh, the economics for solar in DC are quite good. Uh, wind, um, ORC, uh, therm wastewater thermal is a, is a huge opportunity for us. And we put together this list and we have project details on some of these. You know, this list contains things that are truly aspirational. You know, we, we haven't done really a whole lot of work except dream about them. Uh, some of them we've done feasibility studies. So we sort of, those are in the study category. And then there are a few that we have implemented. As you'll see later, we've put uh, a decent amount of solar in and we're doing some, some sewer heat recovery. So we just we just wanted that map as, as a reminder of, of the opportunities. And really these opportunities exist in every city throughout the world that has uh, uh, a first world sewage system. So the first thing is we have some small Blue Plains uh, solar installations, some things like uh, emergency cameras and, and lights. And we've got a few panels over a guard shack here. That was, that was done very early on, but it's, you know, it set the example and set the tone for us and said, oh, we want to do some more of this. So we we have now, this is an aerial view of Blue Plains again. This is that 65 hectares, 165 acres of land. And we're doing this in two phases. Phase one is complete. And we are, we just flipped the switch on, on phase one, which is over uh, rooftops, parking lots, um, uh, out here on our, our receiving dock, and then some ground mount over here too. This, these are the, these are the phase one installations. Phase two, we have a 60% design for, but we, we haven't quite figured out how we're going to fund it, but that is over these uh, settling tanks. And phase one gives us four and a half megawatts of power when the sun's shining, and phase two will give us about 11 or 12 megawatts of power. When the when the sun is shining, um, so you know it's going to get us closer to grid neutrality. Um, these are some of the phase one installations over parking lots, some ground mounts, some roof mounts, and I love this photo. This is uh, bottom right. If you guys can see my cursor, but the bottom right photo here is one of our employees charging his electric vehicle with renewable power. That is really that's the ultimate for, for me personally and for us as an organization, because, you know, it's great to have EVs all over, but if it, if they're charging from power that comes from coal, then that's not really doing us a whole lot of good. So this is, this is the perfect scenario is charging these EVs from renewable power. I'm very proud of that. So we are uh, about to start on a project to put um, solar panels on top of uh, one of our reservoirs. We have a lot of covered reservoirs in DC that we control the space on top of. And this is the first one. It's uh, fairly high up. It's uh, near Gallaudet University, it's the Brentwood Reservoir, uh, right in the center of DC. And it's, you know, we don't, they don't have trees on top of them. And we've got nice, nice opportunity to uh, capture the, the, the sun. So this is a, a solar for all project where we're going to, we contracted with somebody to do this. And then they're going to provide solar to solar energy to those in need at a reduced cost. And we're leasing the land to them. The next one we do, we're going to invest in the solar panels and we're going to own the energy and we're going to own the renewable energy credits, uh, which would then allow us to power whatever power needs we have here at, at, the, at the reservoir. And then because DC allows for net metering, we can push the rest of the power onto the grid and use it down at Blue Plains. So then we can, we can count that as towards our renewable totals at Blue Plains. So that, that really makes a lot of sense for us that we did this so that we can learn a lot and we did and I think our next one's going to be different. So we've looked at all the different opportunities for solar throughout the city, including uh, reservoirs that are controlled by the aqueduct, but we have a good relationship with them. The Washington aqueduct supplies the, 
fresh water for us to distribute to citizens. Uh, and then uh, all of the DC water owned assets as well. And we've looked at all of them. This is the Bryant Street pumping station. We looked at all the different potential areas, identified what they are, figured out what the space is, and then we zeroed in on each of these. I'm just gonna use the Hilltop lease lot as an example <laughs> and looked at the potential of what we could generate, how many megawatts per year, how much in power it's worth, what the recs are worth, what the potential payback period is. is. So we have this for a dozen sites throughout DC, each of which have five or six individual sites on them. So we've done a nice extensive analysis of this, and now we're we're figuring out how to how to fund this because if we do this again, it would it would do a lot towards getting us towards grid neutrality back at, at Blue Plains. The other thing that I'm personally very excited about is sewer heat recovery. Because every city in the world that has a sewer system has this asset flowing beneath its its feet, and it doesn't work everywhere. You know, um, it depends on the climate. But DC is a nice climate to do this, and I would imagine Germany. It would work as well. In fact, some of this technology is is German technology, um, but it is uh, it is a system where we pull heat out of the sewers because we you know we in our homes and in our industries we put BTUs into the water that we use with our dishwashers our shower our clothes washers um, and then it goes into the sewers and it's insulated by the earth and then it comes down to the treatment plants and we don't have a temperature limit on our on our our permits so those BTUs just go out into the river and a it's not great for the river and b it's a complete waste of energy so we should we really need to figure out a way to harvest that um, we've calculated that for every million gallons per day of base flow through our sewers it's equivalent roughly if you if you convert it to megawatt hours it's a roughly one megawatt hour of of or one megawatt of of thermal energy equivalent equivalent thermal energy so we've got 200 million gallons a day of base flow that's the potential to pull 200 megawatts of thermal energy out uh, and we've done this at our, our new headquarters on the anacostia river this this beautiful building here was built Part of the reason that we could do this, you know, it's this palatial headquarters, but we didn't have to buy land. We built it on top of an old pump station that we had. We already controlled the land, the O Street pumping station. And that gave us the opportunity to install equipment that would pull heat out of the pump station and then transfer it to a medium that we could then could be uh, used to heat the entire building. So this entire building is heated and then we use it in the summer as a, as a sink for, for cooling. Uh, with the sewers and it's really it's just like geothermal except you don't have to go as deep um, and again every city in the world has this as this uh, this um, resource flowing beneath its feet so that is great to do it on a building by building basis and it's you know if you're built on top of a pump station that's great but that doesn't happen very often a sewage pump station so where it makes more sense is to do district energy and again this is all over Europe but we're trying to bring some of this technology to to the states here, and we have a we have a uh, a feasibility study to take uh, flow out of the main pump station, build a district energy facility over here, which is a new development near where our this is the baseball stadium in D.C. and the soccer stadium is right over here, <laughs> and all of this is getting developed with with new buildings that have to meet city code for for. Um, for efficiency, and one way to do that is to provide this technology. So we have some some developers who are very interested in this, and that makes more sense because you can put one system in, pull a whole bunch of heat, and then uh, distribute it uh, through this district energy system to buildings in the area. Uh, so we're very excited about this. We're not absolutely positive it's going to happen, but we have this feasibility study that says that it makes sense for us, and we just have to see if we can uh, get some of these buildings uh, to commit to it. So if you look at the Blue Plains power use, and this is really just Blue Plains, this is not looking at any of the uh, potential for uh, bringing in net metered energy from outside the city. But if you look at it, we're doing pretty well. Oftentimes we just look at electricity and green electricity percentages. And if you do that, we're at about 25%, 30% renewable. But I feel like that that's, underselling our story it really should include the natural gas that we use and the recovered heat 
in DC, that recovered heat is considered to be a renewable energy source. And we registered it with the, with the state, with DC, and we can sell those renewable energy credits on the open market. So it is, it's definitely a renewable energy source. And if you look at this, this, these graphs, this is for all of last calendar year, the light brown is, is our natural gas use. The dark brown is our grid energy draw. The dark green is our uh, turbine electricity production. And then the light green is the thermal energy converted again to megawatt hours that we pull off of the turbines. Um, so that is equivalent to, and in some cases, slightly more than the electricity. It's, it's, it's really taking full advantage of the efficiencies of the turbine uh, by pulling the, um, the heat off. And then you can sort of see a little sliver of solar on top of here. This was last year before we flipped the switch on phase one of solar uh, that I showed you earlier. But you, know, you can see we're already up at, you know, 40, uh, as high as 45% renewable energy, considering these three sources. And if we look into the future, if I look into the crystal ball and we look towards uh, some of the projects that I described, you know, the um, renewable um, solar that could be net metered back to DC or back to Blue Plains. And if we look at uh, the possibility of doing co-digestion and a couple of other things at, at Blue Plains to make more gas, we can get, you know, by the end of, nearing the end of the decade, we can get to well over 50%, 54% renewable energy. And this does not even consider the analysis of this brown portion here. Whoops, sorry. Because this brown portion just assumes that it's all grid power and it's all uh it's all coming from fossil fuels but our power suppliers are required to have a certain percentage of this come from renewable sources and by the time this year comes along 2027 that percentage is fairly high i think it's i don't have it right in front of me but it's i think it's 50 percent of the power has to be from renewable sources so if you if we assume that that is going to happen and that our grid power is 50% renewable, this percentage goes up over 70%. So we are, we're really, I can sort of see it on the horizon the day when we can get towards grid neutrality at one of the world's largest advanced wastewater treatment plants. I'm, I'm really excited about that prospect and the example that it sets because it's it shows that it's possible. It's not a passive activity um, and it shows that you don't have to buy wind power from you know West Virginia to do it. We can We can really do it all uh, locally with, with these assets that we control. Um, and then from a carbon standpoint, you know, we're looking at some of these other <laughs> possible projects. We've got all these solar assets, phase two at Blue Plains, um, some of the offsite re reservoirs, Fort Reno and Fort Stanton are reservoirs. Um, and then some of our non-solar options, which is uh, the thermal recovery district energy projects, renewable natural gas project, co-digestion, all these, we've, we've calculated if we implement these, what the potential um, avoided carbon is per year. So we're using that as a, as, as a, uh, a measuring stick and one of the criteria for choosing these, these uh, technologies. So I could talk all day. <laughs> I'm not gonna do that because I wanna open it up for questions and see if there are any comments or anything. Uh, but our mantra is there is no such thing as waste, only wasted resources and we gotta, we're going to do what we can to take advantage of those resources. So thanks. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you, Chris and uh, Dr. Gunther. That was a um, really enlightening presentation. I, uh, I particularly like your energy dream map. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. And, um, you know, it, obviously we've been uh, quite interested in the, the work that DC Water is doing on energy both at the plant and at you know other locations. So um, I guess now, Dale, do you want to um, open it up for the Q and A? And you have any? Yeah, questions? that's yeah, that sounds great. I mean, I just want to say thanks to um, Lars, to Chris, everyone for for orchestrating this. Um, Chris, what were your thoughts when you were watching uh, Lars's presentation? What were some of the first impressions that you had and how did they connect to your work at Blue Plains? Yeah, I just, I mean, I, I look, 
I look to places like Germany and I, I see the future of the US. So we you know we're that that sewer heat recovery technology, as I mentioned, is German technology. So I, I love seeing that. And I and I, uh, I'll ask you right now, Lars, if you could send me your presentation, because I want to use a bunch of those photos to try and convince the powers that be that we need to do more. So it, it would be great if I could get a copy of that. Um, but I just I, I feel like that's that's what we need to strive for uh, is that type of thinking. My follow up question is, why does it seem that the, the des design for digesters in Europe is so much more chic than what we get? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. More, more of an eye towards aesthetics, maybe. <laughs> Lord, I, want to ask this, I want to ask the same question. What was running through your mind when you were listening to Chris? Um, we also have blue, blue, uh, how do you call it? Blue planes, yeah? <laughs> Uh, for using solar power, but um, I I think um, we don't uh, we should compare uh, the sunshine uh, periods uh, from Bocho to Washington. I think uh, we don't have so much um, success um, by uh, using solar power. Well, part part of why it's so attractive in DC is that the DC City Council set up a renewable portfolio standard to. To encourage solar production, so there are strong, strong incentives to do it. That's I, I, that's part of why we're doing it because we're, we want to hit this window where it makes economic sense. And you start your presentation by saying you are out of space. I like this. Well, yeah. <laughs> you are really out of space. I think. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We're going to have to start stacking. But one of the uh, impressions that struck me and this was shared. When Jeff and I were also in Botop a couple of years ago, was um, how powerful something as simple as a public display of the energy consumption at the last slide of Lars's presentation. Um, that is, if I'm not mistaken, too Lars, it's online. I mean, people can click onto the plant and just see the progression of the of the operations towards climate neutrality. And I'm thinking, is that something that uh, you know I might consider taking up? Yes, absolutely. We, um, it's always been part of our plan and we've got things drafted up, but nothing is, nothing's implemented yet. We, we, we absolutely are going to do that though. I was excited, you know, now, now that we have a bunch of solar power being produced at Blue Plains, I think now's the time to do it. Yeah. Um, we're starting to run out of time. Um, I, we should have made the um, request that if you have any questions, park them into the chat box. I haven't seen any go live. Um, I would like to um, ask again, Lars, what was um, the incentive initially? When when I first visited Botrop, I think 14, 15 years ago, colleagues of mine from the EPA were impressed with the high percentages of electricity pr production. I think it was about a third coming from methane recovery. And what was the basis of the policy basis for that? Was this just an odd phenomenon of Botra? Or is there some underlying set of laws and programs that encouraged or incentivized high productions of methane recapture and, and, and uh, recycling? Plan. Yes, um, I'm. I'm not quite sure. I'm. Um, I am in in Bartrop now uh, since 2012, and um, of course, uh, maybe just a few words to my person. I studied civil engineering in uh, Braunschweig in Brunswick in Lower Saxony in, in Germany. And um, I always, uh, um, this is one of, of our, um, they focus a lot of, of sludge. And this was uh, very interesting for me to come to Botra because uh, you have a lot of sludge there, yes. And um, the, the programs they had uh, were um, focused on, on using the methane first. Um, um, using uh, solar energy, um, it uh, grows up in, in 2010, 2011, 12, around about this. So these were our first ideas to, 
to use it for drying the sludge because um, the coal, uh, of course, is, is not a, a future technology. Yeah, using coal for for uh, rising the um, the, um, the uh, in order to 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 burn the the sludge. Yes. So yeah. um, and. This was the the startup period where we uh, thought about using solar energy, but it is not so quite easy as it seems, because um, you can when you dry your sludge you can um, you can um, over dry it, <laughs> and then you have a problem with the heat in the incineration, or you are too low, uh, so that um, the the heat value is too low, or you are uh, just uh, at the point where it burns perfectly, but this is the, the line um, pe period of phase. We say uh, um, the, the sludge is, uh, is very uh, difficult to handle uh, in, in this period of, of 40 to, to uh, 60 percent dry matter. And um, this is the reason why we overdrive the sludge up to 65 to 70 percent. and just just in front of the incineration we mix it with uh, um, with a simple dewatered slush in order to to um, keep it, uh, um, it uh, in order to put it to the incineration so uh, there there are a lot of um, um, very difficult processes and um, up to now we just uh, we are drying the sludge already but uh, I think we tested it in the incineration once or twice up to now. And it was quite difficult. Yeah. Chris, I wanted to tie Lars's presentation to the wish, wish list slide that you had. And if there were two things that you could take tomorrow from Botrop and apply to at the local level at any piece of the operations of Blue Plains, what would it be? Oh geez, well, I, you know, we, we don't we don't do any wind right now, so that would probably be part of the what I'd like to to consider and implement. And then it'd really be nice to have uh, the sludge drying facility that you guys have. We looked at that, but we don't have enough space. <laughs> um, we are we're considering offsite locations, but if we could get something to to just sort of diversify our um, our our end uses, it would be great. And uh, I guess if we could stack uh, stack that on top of something else at the plant and use some of the excess heat that we have for drying, that would be ideal. But that, those are the two things that interest me most. Great. Uh, Jeff, uh, we're getting close to the quarter hour mark past uh, one. Is Are there any things that you want to ask um, before we tie this thing up? Um, no, I think, uh, you know, that I've was really pleased to have these presentations and learned quite a bit and look forward to uh, I wonder if anybody has any questions uh, in the audience. Okay, I think we'll tie up. Well, the next step is Chris and Lars together over beers. Um, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> Thank you so much yeah, for sharing your time. Fun. Your schedules are really busy. These are great presentations. This is just the beginning of a lot more conversations that we're going to have. And I want to say thanks to Lars, to Chris for being so kind, um, taking so much effort to organize such great slides. And uh, we look forward to staying in touch. Yeah, me too. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. And look out. <laughs> yes, well, thank you. It was very interesting for me. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Thanks Tim. Okay, bye. Thanks, Derek. Bye.